With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. A week is a long time in politics. A year is gigantic in sporting terms. Tokyo 2020 plus one has already seen it all. Controversy, resignations, retirements, comebacks. And the games haven't even started yet. In this podcast, as the latest British team announcements for the Tokyo Olympics are revealed, we'll be looking at the winners and losers already from the delayed games. I'm Michael. And I'm John. Yes, coming up, an Olympic champion is back in the rowing team. A world medalist in gymnastics misses out. And what now for two double Olympic champions? We'll also revel in, reveal and even hear some of the new names and young stars who will be gracing your TV screens in stadiums this summer. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic Sport podcast. And as ever, we'll round up the rest of the Olympic and Paralympic sporting headlines, the world records, hockey, canoeing, skateboarding, women's football, and how many of Team GB have received their vaccine ahead of travelling to Japan. As ever, you can get in touch at Anything But F on Twitter, or you can message us on Insta and Facebook. Our website is anythingbutfooty.com, or email anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. It's been a very busy week in the world of Olympic and Paralympic sport, certainly for Team GB. So we will start this whistle-stop tour with rowing. And 45 British rowers have been named for Tokyo 2020. 37 of them will be making their debut in a squad that some might say lack experience slightly, certainly on the world stage. But they are making up for it with drive and determination and some medal-winning performances as well in the run-up to the Games next month. Helen Glover is probably the most famous name, the standout name, the big name in the side, returning for a third title in the women's pair. She had, you'll recall, quit the sport, had a family with TV's Steve Blacksell. The London and Rio gold medalist Helen Glover decided, though, to return to training last year during lockdown and with the Games delayed by 12 months, has teamed up with Rio silver medalist Polly Swan, who spent her lockdown as a doctor working for the NHS for a shot at glory again. Also returning, Vicky Thornley. More women are picked in the British rowing team than men. This time, Vicky is in the single skulls after coming second with Dame Catherine Granger in Rio five years ago. This year's European and World Rowing Cup two champions in the men's four, Ollie Cook, Matt Rossiter, Rory Gibbs and Sholto Carnegie will be looking to maintain Britain's gold medal success in that event. It dates back to Sydney 2000, Redgrave Pinson and all that, 21 years now. And the men's eight will be defending their gold medal with Rio gold medalist Mohamed Sabi. Plus, he's joined by some debutantes. Harry Fieldman, the Cox, Jacob Dawson, Tom George, Charlie Elwes, Ollie Wynn Griffith, Tom Ford and Josh Bugazzi, who a year ago wouldn't have made the eight. James Rudkin is also in and he's been speaking to anything but footy and telling John what an honour it's been to get the Team GB kit. It's it's amazing. You know, I'm going to use the word excited a lot in this interview, but I think that, that kind of sums it up really. Like, it's the... Uh, 
is the culmination of a, a, a lot of hard work and a, a real kind of dream come true. And it's obviously like the selection is one thing and that's, that's awesome. But the, you know, the job is to go there and, uh, and win medals. And that's once this, once this day's over, you're going to kind of put all the excitement out of your mind and focus on, on the task at hand. But no, I, I think it's uh, very much to enjoy today and then uh, put it aside and, and move forward. Yeah, we'll talk about Tokyo in a moment, but you, you mentioned a lot of hard work. How long has the road been for you? Well, I mean, it's, it's going to yeah, it's gonna sound a bit silly, but I actually first got in a boat when I was seven uh, and I'm, uh, I'm 26 now. So it's been, it's been a long, long time. Um, my dad was a rower uh, back in the day and he still is actually. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, no, I, I first, first rowed, he, he taught me to row. And uh, I started to take it more seriously as I got through school and, and then more at university. And then I've been on the team now for the last what, five years since the postponement. Uh, it's been, it should have been four, but now it's five. Um, and yeah, it's, it's been a, this, this, this year has been tough. Obviously, COVID has changed the game completely. And we've had to kind of adapt and change and just be patient. But I think, uh, you know, we're here now and, and the goal is very much in sight. And it's, uh, it's been a long time, but it's been, hopefully been worth the wait. How will your dad be feeling with the news today then? I'm, I'm sure, well, you know, I hope he's very proud. I know, I know he's proud. Um, we're very, so we're very, you know, very close family. And we kind of, you know, they're very, very, very supportive parents. You know, they come to as many races as they can. You know, unfortunately, this, this would have been, uh, you know, an amazing, like, they'd have loved to be up there, you know, screaming and shouting from the bank. But that's, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. And they're just going to have to sit and scream at the TV but no they, they've been very very supportive of me on my journey and uh, yeah my, my parents and my family are, I'm sure they're, they're incredibly proud and that's the thing it's not just an individual although you know it is an individual sport and a team sport rowing mm. you've got so much support around you to get to where you've got to today and then moving up and moving forward well exactly I mean especially in the eight you know you've got you've got you've got parents you've got grandparents brothers sisters all, all sorts of friends, you've got the whole kind of community behind us, so each person. So it, the eight itself brings together, there's probably, you know, hundreds of people connected to our one crew, which is quite incredible if you think about it. It's going to be hundreds and then like, you know, maybe thousands of people that know us and know all of us well, just kind of sitting there, hopefully watching us on the start line. And it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I think everyone knows that there's so much behind this and there's so much more than, you know, any performance that we're able to put out is we the product of so of so much more than us. Basically, it's a product of everyone. So let's talk about the eight. Um, some might say an inexperienced eight in Olympic terms. Mm. Yeah, well, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I think uh, you know Mo is the only one in the crew that's been to Olympic Games, um, and that does that counts for a lot. You know, he's got a lot of experience, and he's you know he's the most talented guy in the crew. He's been there, and, he, and he's done the job before. Um, and it's a real kind of, it's a privilege to have to, to be with him and to have him in the crew. And he really kind of gives us really strong leadership. And I think for all the rest of us, it's just like, we have to kind of harness that experience, but also know that, you know, you're not an Olympic champ, you know, you're not an Olympic champion or an Olympian or an Olympic medalist until you are, you know, every, everyone, everyone who's achieved that has, has not been an Olympic champion beforehand, you know, so you have to, you have, you have to kind of, you still have to do it. You have to get out there and, uh, and, you know, come from, come from nothing. Thing and, and come to uh, come to get your biggest performance. So I think it's I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a, it's a negative. To be honest, I think we're fresh and we're ready and we're and we're excited and we've got leadership around us in, in Mo and in the coaches. You know, our coach is Steve Trapmore, who is an Olympic champion in the men's eight. And you know, the team itself has got plenty of experienced people around, and I feel that we're ready. You know, we, we're we're so excited to go. And uh, as I say, we feed off the experience and give it the energy that the younger people in the crew bring. And you're in great form as well. The World Cup in Lucerne, the narrowest, narrowest, narrowest wins over the Germans and a European gold as, as well. Yeah, no, those were two fantastic races. I think it's, uh, you know, that those are the first gold medals I've won really on, on the senior team. You know, we've been, a, as you say, as you mentioned, we're a very young team. We've been a team that's been building over the last five years and it's been down to our kind of diligent processes and, and, and training that's put that, that delivers big races like that and you know we, we've been challenged multiple times we, as I say we've lost plenty of races before and we've learned from that lot those losses it's what our old coach Jürgen used to say is that a loser always trains harder I think that's what we've been doing is we've been pushing ourselves forward every day knowing that we haven't been good enough and you know the, the, the final results of the, the impact are still to come and we know that we need to keep pushing and keep getting better and obviously that's fantastic to win 
close races like in Lucerne. And I'm sure those will put us in a good position mentally in terms of knowing what we can do. But ultimately, all that matters is, is the Olympic final and we've got to deliver when it counts. Where's, the, where's your head at in terms of pressure, James? Because we all know British rowers always <laughs> deliver at the Olympics and we can rattle off all the famous names from Redgrave to Pinsent to Granger uh, to um, um, Helen Glover as well and Mo Sabihi, as you mentioned. Where is your head at with pressure, knowing that you guys always deliver at the right time? Well, I think I'd kind of bring it back to what I said before, is actually for, it could be argued that for three or four years, we haven't actually delivered. So we've been the crews that have, have everyone said that, we're, that everyone's written off. You know, in the first two years, the game, you know, my first year in the team, we came seventh in the men's eight. You know, we didn't make the final. And that was a real kind of crushing experience. And you, and you learn from that, you know, that, that, that fires you up, that brings you forward. And so I, I've actually learned to deal with not delivering when it, you know, at the, at when it counts. And I think from that, I'm now, I'm now a stronger athlete. I'm a better person, more motivated. I'm more technically proficient, all this kind of thing. And I, and I, I feel like I'm ready now to go and, to go and win and go and be the best. Like, that's what I want to do. And I, don't, and I feel clearly there is pressure. You know, as you say, Team GB, the British rowing team, has been a, a stalwart of success for Team GB over the over previous Olympics. And that's, you know, you feed off that. You know that there are people that have delivered in the past, you know, great names, as, as you mentioned. But it's, you know, I don't, I don't try to think about that too much. You know, like, as I say, I've learned from being not successful and then learning how to deliver success. And I hope that's, that's the lessons I'll take forward uh, over the next two months. I'm sure at the crew announcement today, lots of people will be asked about how you'll deal with Tokyo, how you'll deal with mm. the restrictions, how you deal with COVID. What's the one thing you're really looking forward to, though, at these Olympics? I think I'm just, I'm very excited to kind of feel the atmosphere of the village and, and of the course. Like, it's going to be different. Like, I think we all appreciate that. It's not, I mean, it, it'll be different from what other people might have experienced yeah, previous yeah. games, but it's also like, I, I haven't experienced an Olympics before. So I'm not going there thinking, oh, why isn't this the same? Oh, why isn't oh, it doesn't feel right? Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know what to expect. I'm just going there, enjoying all of it and looking forward to all of it. So I think, I, I definitely, yeah, as I say, I think the village is going to be awesome. I think seeing other nations and like, you know, it's obviously going to be socially distanced. We're not going to be exactly going to be mixing and all this kind of thing, but we're getting kind of a vibe of, of what's going on and, and everyone else competing at their best is going to be pretty awesome. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. And the racing itself, you know, okay, there's not, there's probably not going to be crowds. I don't know exactly the confirmation of that, but it's probably going to be pretty quiet. And that's similar with a lot of rowing races. You know, there, there are, it's obviously it's a lot, you know, the, the course for rowing is long. So the course isn't completely packed with crowds for the best of time. So we're kind of used to that. Like, I don't think that would be a big thing. So it just be, it should be, it'll just be like a, a normal regatta. And all we know, we've raced the cruise, a lot of these crews before. And everyone's going to deliver their best and, and that's going to have to be what we do. And, and ultimately that will decide our success. We're just so excited to go out and, and represent our country and, and try to do our family and friends proud. Talking of which, knowing millions of people in this country will be watching on the television, supporting you guys and looking for some cheer this summer. <laughs> well, exactly. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a real special, special moment. Like I think I hope, I hope that the Olympics will be something that the kind of country can unite around and see actually like you know, there is a future here, like sport is, is one of those like incredible things that just brings everyone together and everyone can, can get around. And I think that, uh, I think it's going to be amazing. And I really hope that everyone tunes in and, and has a great time. I'm sure they will. James, thank you so much for talking to Anything at Footy. Thanks a lot, John. It's been great. James Rodkin there speaking with John and talking of experience. Five-time Olympian, three times Olympic silver medalist Fran Houghton is working with the women's eight crew. Fiona Gammon, Sarah Parfit, Rebecca Edwards, Chloe Brew, Catherine Douglas, Cara McMurty, Becky Mazzeri, Emily Ford and the, the Cox Matilda Horn. The rest of the squad, 24 women and 21 men remember are the European silver medalist Emily Craig and Imogen Grant. They go in the lightweight women's double. Matilda Hodgkins-Byrne, Hannah Scott, Charlotte Hodgkins-Byrne and Lucy Glover, who are in the women's quad. European bronze medalist John Collins and Graham Thomas in the men's double. Rowan McKellar, Harriet Taylor, Karen Bennett and Rebecca Shorten in the women's four. And that men's quad crew who recently won bronze at the 2021 World Rowing Cup 2, Harry Lease, Angus Groom, Thomas Barris and Jack Beaumont. I think that's a pretty comprehensive roundup of the rowing, John. 
I thought it was impressive. I mean, you were very good. It was like reading out a register. Uh, yes, sir, I'm here. I'm here. But what a what a squad. I mean, mentioning more women than men, as we know, it will probably be the same with Team GB in general. But I also got the impression, having spoken to, and we've spoken to, what, five or six rowers now? Yep. If you'd have asked me a year ago, I'd have said we were going to struggle in Tokyo a little bit. Agreed. Now I'm feeling a lot more confident. Yep, I am too. I certainly think some of the results, you know, the the medal return from the recent European Championships has been good. And just speaking to people in and around the rowing program, um, and I think there was a couple of things a year ago. Obviously, the the famous coach Jurgen Grubler re- retired, yep. and a lot of people, yep. you know, thought well that was slightly odd timing, maybe. But simply, you know, he was at the end of his contract, and it was it was time for him to move on. And there are a lot of new names, a lot of people there that we perhaps don't know. But I do feel that when we've spoken to the rowers and the support staff and the people around them, that British rowing are quietly, quietly confident. And I think like a lot of the people we have been speaking to over the past year, many of the results in these games will depend on who has coped with the pandemic the best. Um, What we've got in this country is we've got a very quick return as far as elite sports people. And I know to the recreational swimmers and golfers and all the other things there were huge frustrations and they felt that it went on too long but for the elite sports people those going to the olympics the paralympics they were able to get back to work quite quick quickly and we know that with uk sport and the backing that team gb and the work they're doing behind the scenes as well everything is in place for performance every little detail is is looked at and, and dealt with mentally and physically and i think that means that we might get some better results and different results than perhaps the ones we expect. And I think it's great as well having Helen Glover back. Just allows that experience. You, you, you've been there, you've done it, you've won the gold medals and that can kind of permeate around the squad as well and people can check in with her as I'm sure they will but she's also, I got the impression, she's also excited to be back as though I'm, I'm getting another chance here. Yeah, well, I would say, though, um, and we'll go on and talk about it probably in more depth when we discuss gymnastics in a moment. She's not there as a cheerleader. She's not there as a mascot. She's not there on sentiment. She will only be in that boat because her ergo times and her times on the water and her strength and conditioning and everything else that she's been doing over the past year is right. And she's only there and she's only in the team because of that. She's she's not just going to, you know, carry the flag and have a couple of weeks in, in Japan. Um, in a hotel room. In a hotel room. She's going there because she's the best rower in that seat, in that boat, in terms of the ability and the times that she's been showing. And she's always been one of the best rowers in British rowing throughout her whole career. She's always delivered, whether that was with Heather Stanning for the last two Olympics. And I'm sure we'll see with Polly Swan as well, uh, the the victory they had earlier on in this season. um, Slight injuries uh, concern um, for for the last race, but they will be back and I'm sure they will do the business in Tokyo. You mentioned gymnastics. This is Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. And there's no denying, Michael, it's been a tough year for British gymnastics following the start of an official review into serious allegations about the treatment of gymnasts by UK Sport and Sport England to this week unveiling the women's Olympic team. On socials, they asked everyone to be fair and kind to the gymnasts selected, which were Alice Kinsella, Emily Morgan and Jessica and Jennifer Gadirova, two 16-year-old twins. Now let's talk about them who are going to the Olympics, the team that's going to the Olympics before we discuss Who's not in it? Because that has been controversial this week. They have all done all they can. They've trained, they've performed, and now they've been selected. And that is all you can do. Now, they're all making their debuts. We talked about it with the rowing. A little inexperienced. But Kinsella is the most experienced, winning Commonwealth gold in 2018 on the beam, the European title in 2019, and then finishing in the all-round top 12 of the World Championships in 2019. Amelie is in this year's uneven bars, European bronze medalist, and fourth in the all-round 
round. While Jessica Gadarova, these are great stories, made her international debut in that competition, the Europeans this year as well, winning a gold, a silver and a bronze in the floor, vault and all round. And her twin sister Jennifer created history by winning a medal in the first ever Junior World Championships. Now, James Thomas, the British Gymnastics Performance Director, you will have heard probably a lot about him this week. Uh, He has said with such a strong pool of talent in Great Britain and only four places available, the selection meant making difficult decisions. And the difficult decision, as we know, was the omission of Becky Downey, 29 years of age, a world silver medalist on the uneven bars in 2019. And the backdrop to it, of course, is the tragic personal story. She lost her brother this year. Her younger sister, Ellie Downley, decided not to even try for the Games. Both gymnasts have spoken out about their treatment in the past, um, various bullying allegations, as we know, uh, that has dogged British gymnastics over the last year or so. In a statement, Becky, who did unsuccessfully appeal the decision, said that she didn't know what the future held, uh, but she didn't want to retire like this. The campaign group, Gymnast for Change, have claimed the decision to omit Becky Downey was a in their words, sinister warning to those who might speak out. British Gymnastics restated that decisions were made on gymnastic merit. Of course, our sympathies, our thoughts continue to go to the Downey family, but our best wishes also, I think, have to go to the gymnasts selected for Tokyo as well. A couple of thoughts on the omission of Becky Downey. I think the appeals process is probably worth looking at in the future. I certainly think... From what I've read and and heard, a lot of athletes feel that the appeals process is not maybe as open and transparent as it could be. You're not allowed to publish the findings. What exactly are they looking at in that appeals process? I'd like to know a bit more about that. I don't know anything about that, and perhaps I I should um, if I'm presenting this podcast, but it seems to be something that happens behind closed doors. And talking of behind closed doors, we don't know what has been happening day in, day out in training. You know, these athletes, these gymnasts, and we've seen it with swimmers and triathletes and everything else have been getting on and working in the past year and they've been monitored and there's this huge performance set up around them. Um, And British Gymnastics will have selected their four, I presume because the target is a team medal that they feel is, is probably the medal that they could realistically win as opposed to some individual medals. Uh, you know, Becky's world medal was two years ago now. A lot has happened um, since then. So, yeah, I go back to, to what we said. You know, best wishes have to go to the gymnast selected for Tokyo and we'll see what happens. You reminded me it's a bit like what happened with the taekwondo team. Yeah, before 2012, Aaron Cook was the world champion taekwondo fighter for, for Great Britain. And he was, in in anyone's mind... Apart from the selectors in the room making the decision, looking at form, a, a dead cert for Team GB. And I remember there was um, a lot of question marks about the decision for him not to represent Team GB. He wasn't picked. He didn't compete at London 2012 at the Olympics. Actually, the person who was picked ahead of him medaled. Um, my mum will tell me off using that word because she said it's not a word. He won a medal. Um, and you can look at that and go, well, was the right decision made? Now, I agree with you. We're not in the room when the decisions are made. It's very easy to go on social media, pick up your phone, have an opinion. Doesn't mean it's right. We've not got the data. We, 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 we can't make the decision one way or another. We can have sympathy for all of the Downey family, as we've said, but we can also wish the gymnasts who have been selected and they've been selected for a reason and we've talked about some of those uh, achievements as well and it will the decision will be what the decision will be and we'll find out in six weeks time yeah and those of course are the artistic gymnasts but also under the bracket of gymnastics trampolining yeah huge congratulations to rio silver medalist bryony page and laura gallagher who've been named by Team GB to compete in the trampolining in Tokyo. We'll hear from Gallagher in a moment, a really inspiring story and her career in a tick. But you'll remember Paige, Michael does particularly, uh, the, at the kitting out, Michael, you, you met her before she went to Rio and where she went and won that medal. Yeah, I did. I was um, making a 
radio series to go on a radio station in Yorkshire. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'm doing the same thing at the moment. Um, but I was, I was making a radio series and I'd, I'd obviously done my, my homework on everyone and that had been selected and everyone that was in the British team. And Bryony wasn't from Yorkshire, but she'd been based in Sheffield and she trained in Sheffield and she'd made her home in Sheffield. So I had some time with her at the, the kitting out and I remember thinking, and she was very nervous about doing the interview. That that was one of the first things I remember. She was, And at the end, she was like, was that okay? Can I do any of it again for you? Um, I'm not sure I said the right things. And not I, many and it, athletes. Not many athletes say that, do they? No, and it, but it, it was really endearing. And I can remember, like we always do, you say, well, you know, what, what do you want to do when you get to Rio? What's success? And they always say, well, you know, you take it one step at a time. I need to qualify for the final, first of all. That's got to be the ambition then once I'm in the final who knows anything can happen it's all about the day and it is literally a day with trampolining it all is all done and dusted in one day she got into that final she led for ages and ages and then eventually I think with the last the last trampolinist she she dropped down and won a silver medal and just burst into tears of joy and I it was a really good story she probably wasn't on anyone's fantasy olympic list of medalists that people try and put together um but you know she'd she'd had a fourth place at world and european level and and she made the step up she's had a wretched time since certainly for Mm. a couple of years um i know physically um she had a couple of really big surgeries on the ankle and i think the fact that she had the second surgery affected her mentally as well but she's back and you know I've, i've spoken to her since since he's been selected i know you have as well and she's told us that she's in a really good place mentally. And yeah, in the team um, with Laura Gallagher, who's making a debut. Yeah, exactly. And you'll be able to hear from Bryony Page on that radio series, 21 for 21, that we're making. It's on all our socials. There are links and stuff if you haven't listened to it. If you download the podcast every week and you haven't heard all the other interviews, we've done about 80 athlete interviews that you can listen to, Olympic and Paralympic, um, all through our friends at Communicore, who are the radio group Heart Capital and Excess Manchester, and also the Audio Content Fund, uh, who are funding it as well. Um, it is really worth listening to. It's not. It's not got us in it. It's nothing about us. It's about the athletes, and it's about their stories. And talking of stories, thirty-two-year-old uh, Laura Gallagher has a story to tell. It's her first Olympics, as Michael said, uh, after winning eight medals in um, major championships. And we caught up with her earlier today. Genuinely absolutely stoked um I to be honest it feels quite surreal so all of this today um I think is helping with the process of (laughs) um feeling more real and um I and that's yeah that was a bit of a surprise I think you expect to feel that instant excitement and I did but I think I also it all just felt a little bit like surreal at the time um I don't really know how else to describe it but yeah it is starting to sink in um and yeah and it's just been such a long journey to get to this point so um I'm really like just so stoked that it's happening (laughs) and talk us through the process because obviously you qualified a quota place but that doesn't necessarily mean that you get that quota place so what happens between no I I suppose that's quite confusing for people to understand because um you know lots of people thought that I had got the place uh when I did that but basically there was two routes to qualification one through um the world championships where you could qualify a place by getting into the final and a different person through the world cup series so it couldn't be the same person so there was a maximum of two places that we could qualify in the women's trampoline side for Great Britain um I managed to get into the final and qualify for that first place and the World Cup series finished last weekend and Bryony qualified a place through for Great Britain through that. So um, and then within all of that, they're looking at scores, performances, training data, um, everything um, to meet some criteria in a, in a selection policy. And fortunately, I met that criteria and I'm really happy to be in this position now. <laughs> um, what a contrast from 2016, where I understand you just gave up. Oh no, I didn't just give up. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was um, between London and Rio, I had spent about two years um, sort of away from the trampoline with injuries. 
um, there were quite long injury periods and um, I think I think it, it was just a cumulative thing um, I never sort of had a break from that or gave my time myself time to probably heal a bit mentally with it um, and so when I came back I guess I was physically there but my confidence was just on the floor um, and I was just really really struggling and my performances were not good um, I, I just wasn't performing well. I could do bits and pieces in training. Um, I just sort of lost myself, lost perspective and just not within the, not only the sport, but just myself and my life actually, um, because sport doesn't just affect, you're not just, this is a lifestyle as well as, um, you know, you give everything in the gym, but then you go home and you're still thinking about it. You're still, your lifestyle is still molded around that, um, what you're doing in the gym in order to, to get to where you want to get to. So I think it was just that and it just sort of, it was just setback after setback after setback, just all at once um, over a long period of time. And it just got too much. And um, I was just really in a bad place mentally. And that um, culminated in me um, taking time away from the sport. Um, I definitely didn't just give up. I would never do that. But I, I actually thought that was it. Um, I didn't think I'd come back, but in the process of, um, so I'd, worked most of the time like alongside sport uh, alongside my uh, training and um so I was working in a school um in the process of looking for a different job because I didn't think I'd go back in, into sports something a bit more permanent um I was in that interview process when you're talking about all of the things that you can do and you, you have to sort of sell yourself don't you in an interview um I realised a lot. I've done a lot more than just trampoline. I, I sort of had lost myself in perspective. I didn't think I could do anything. I didn't think I was good at anything. And you know what, my boss um, Anne Boulderstone Dowd, she was just a phenomenal person, like an incredible person, right place, right time. And I, she really helped put me back together. Um, first meeting, she said to me. Um, do you want to play a hockey mat? Uh, do you play hockey? And I was like, well, I haven't played since school. I used to love, love, I'm from a multi-sport background. I used to love sport. And she was like, um, well, there's a game on Saturday. Do you want to play? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I played and loved it. I love hockey. It's something I'll probably do after I finish trampolining. Um, and that just sort of like got me onto the like sort of whole winning and losing and just without any consequences and just loving sport. She, um, you know, when I had an opportunity to come back into the sport when my coach, my personal coach and a national coach sort of um, put it to me and sort of in, was encouraging me to get back into the sport because I knew I knew I wasn't finished. I knew there were lots of things that I needed to overcome in order to be able to look back at my journey and feel um, OK about my journey. You know, I didn't feel OK about my journey. I don't think I, I struggled to watch the Rio games. I it was just, you know, like not not in a bitter way, just in a in a in a painful way. It was it was hard. So um, so I knew I had stuff that I wanted to do, and so sort of on Anne, who was not connected to trampoline, just on the outside, without realizing it, all of the stuff I was doing at work, and I was working with young people um, out, out, in an alternative provision outside of mainstream education, um, many different circumstances, um, and they helped me as much as I hope I helped them. Um, that was uh, an incredible part of the journey and um, part of my healing process too. And um, coming back into the sport, just a phenomenal amount of support from British Gymnastics um, and our national programme led by Tracy. Just, I can't tell you how much has, has changed for me on that front and how, um, how grateful I am for that, um, for that support and opportunity to uh, work my way through those things that I had been struggling with before that they never gave up on me and allowed me to have that opportunity to succeed um, and just it, it there was no real end goal to start with it was just sort of really small steps just like rebuilding confidence and trust in myself and everyone else and um, I just found the love of it again um, I still played hockey for that year and a bit after alongside so I had so this, this was my hobby again um, Obviously, I was training a lot. So I was getting up early, training at the gym, then I'd go to work, then I'd get back and then I would train again. And then I'd go and study because I was still I was doing a um, psychology degree with the Open University for six years um, <laughs> alongside of it. Also, it was all mental and really full on. Um, and then it just 
it just sort of I just was getting the best results that I've had and um yeah that was just it was just I think that's made this five years super special and um and it, it just goes to show with that 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 greater perspective um you're not defined by your sport you're that is that's something that's an incredible part of that's something I do and that's something that my I sacrifice a lot and I wouldn't say sacrifice I don't like saying that I choose to um have the lifestyle that I have I, I live away in the week at the moment Monday to Friday you know that's that's a big commitment on, on for me and my husband who I you know I don't only see at the weekends at the moment um that's 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 um so this this is why it's so special to me um there's that's just the last five years I mean there was a lot going on before then <laughs> I suppose that's why I've been like you know around for quite a long time now but um but yeah just it was um I'm very lucky to have I certainly haven't got here on my own and I'm really grateful for all of those people for um for how you know and my personal coach who I've been with for nearly 20 years that's just um that's that partnership has been really you know that's shaped me who as you know to who I am now um and, and a lot of these skills, you know, I can transfer to life after sport too. But mm. yeah, there's so many people to thank. And I, <laughs> I a true um, um, and a truly inspiring story, Laura, about <laughs> about about sport and about life and about how you can be an inspiration as well, and how other people come into your life and can help you. When and you mentioned it about this being even more special, and you you wonder whether it was all meant to be. Yeah, it's funny you should say that because um, I got to the point where I was like, maybe me and the Olympics are just not meant to be. Um, and then even last year when the, um, um, you know, went the COVID and we had to stop training and the Olympics was postponed, um, I'm, I got a text from my friend Gav and I remember texting him back. And I think um, on the whole, it was generally OK. I understood that like, there was bigger things going on in the world. Um, you know, this is that's just life and um but I just had I think I was just having a funny fight and I texted him back and I and he said to me like um what's going to happen with that and I was like I don't know but um maybe me and the Olympics are just not meant to be that was like uh I don't know April time last year and I was just and yeah it's just I don't know yeah you're right I don't know maybe it was maybe it wasn't I've had to work I I feel like I've sort of I say it a lot because I don't know how else to describe it, but I feel like I've sort of turned myself inside out and changed a lot about myself in order to get to this point too. But I think I know that it's it's maybe um, like it, the opposite. On the same front, whilst I feel like I've turned myself inside and made lots of changes, I also feel like I am more myself in training now. So I don't feel two separate people. I, I, I feel like one whole person. And I'm that whole person. I don't need to change who I am when I go into the gym. I don't need to be serious. Um, I don't need to like, you know, I can bring my whole self into that and train how how I, I want to train. And that's OK. There's no one type of elite athlete. It's everyone is completely different. We all are, we all train completely differently. Um, you know, part of the reason why I train up here is so I can train with my the people who I compete alongside um so um myself Bryony and Kat we've um you know we're all over 30 now this journey has been together um we've got a huge amount of respect for each other in the gym and we all help to push each other on um but we're all so different like we all have completely different ways of training but we all know each other so well and I think that's part of um understanding that it's okay to be um yourself in the gym you know everyone there's no one way or one right way everyone's got their own way um and I think that took me some quite some time to like sort of understand um, you can be yourself and it doesn't matter who you are, you can achieve great things. <laughs> well, good luck. We hope that you achieve great things in the summer. And thank you so much for talking to anything but footy. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. That was Laura Gallagher speaking to us from Lillishaw and the National Sports Centre via their sometimes questionable uh, Wi-Fi, uh, but we got there in the end. She's been named as uh, as we speak in that uh, team for the Olympics. And just a couple of quick things just to, to pick up on out of that interview with Laura. One, what an amazing personal story um, that she has, has gone through, um, which she explained there in, you know, very searing and candid honesty to us. Um, and two, the support 
um, she showed for British Gymnastics and not many people have showed British Gymnastics support over the past year, 18 months. You know, they, they have been under a barrage of criticism and, you know, there will be reports and inquiries and things I'm sure to come and, and the story of, of what's gone on at British Gymnastics. I don't think anyone properly knows yet. Um, and when we do find that out, who knows when that will be. But just listening to what Laura says there, she was in a really bad place, a really dark place, and she paid credit to the, the national governing body that supported her British Gymnastics. And I just think it's important to highlight that that maybe with all the poor publicity that British Gymnastics has had, there is one athlete there that, that feels that their governing body has, has been there for them and supported them. Yeah, and she, she was concerned that she hadn't thanked the right people in that interview, and I'm, I'm pretty sure she did. Um, what you say is absolutely right, Michael, and well done to her. And just go and perform and enjoy your Olympic experience um, because it is going to be an absolutely brilliant occasion this summer. This is the Anything But Footy podcast, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast. We will be talking about paracanoe athletics, triathlon, skateboarding, still to come. It's all happening at the moment. And what a week for GB Boxing. They'll be taking 11 fighters to Tokyo 2020, having topped the qualifying tournament's medal table. Two gold, four silver and two bronze. Now, when I heard, John, that they were taking 11 fighters, I thought there's a good chance a lot of them might win medals. That means a busy Sunday for us, which should be a day... Should be a day where we are winding down a bit and just looking forward to the closing ceremony. But the boxing finals, as we know, the nature of the tournament is they're always at the end. And so that could, that could be a very busy morning for us anyway. Uh, the seven men and four women will be led by gold medalists Lauren Price and Pat McCormack. Middleweight Price is a world, a European champion. She's a former international footballer for Wales. McCormack, he gained revenge for his world championship final defeat in 2019. There were silvers too for Charlie Davidson, Caroline Dubois, Ben Whitaker, Garal Yafai, who is incidentally on our 21 for 21 series. You'll be able to hear him on Hart Yorkshire. And there, are also, there was also a silver medal for Fraser Clark. The bronze medals for Chev Clark and Luke McCormack. The GB Boxing Performance Director, Rob McCracken, who's overseen just a brilliant seam of success for British boxing at Olympic level, described it as a brilliant week in Paris. The boxers delivered when needed. And these boxers, remember, hadn't been in the ring properly for over a year, some of them. Mm, So, you know, it was a tremendous, tremendous uh, tournament for them. And again, clues that the British athletes, I think, have done well in the pandemic and the lockdown. I think they've come out the other side and we've seen it in swimming. We've seen it in so many sports, haven't we? They've come out on the other side really in form. I'll ask the Olympic Committee if they can change the running order for uh, <laughs> boxing so it's not too busy for you on the last day. It's, normally uh, that of... second Wednesday is quite a quiet day for, <laughs> for, the, for the Brits in, in, in traditional Olympics. So if you could just bring the boxing finals forward for me. <laughs> um, you know, closing ceremony day is about relaxing having a beer isn't it it's not about 11 boxers that need to be interviewed it's about it's about them winning gold medals um (laughs) the the headline surely has to be magnificent 11 but anyway um on to para canoe eight para canoeists have been confirmed for tokyo by paralympics gb this week including defending champions emma wiggs and jeanette chippington rio bronze medalist ian marsden also return returns alongside charlotte henschel Laura Sugar, Rob Oliver, Dave Phillipson and debutante Stuart Wood. And again, some great stories in this. Henschel is competing in her third games, but her first in the para canoe, having won medals in the swimming pool in London and Rio. Sugar competed in the sprints in athletics five years ago in Rio, while Phillipson was also part of the wheelchair tennis teams for the last three Paralympics. Shows the strength in depth for para canoe. Good luck to all of them. And as mentioned, we're going to keep saying this a lot. You'll hear from Henschel, Sugar and Wiggs as part of our 21 for 21 radio series running right up till July 23rd, every Tuesday and Thursday. A few names, Michael, that people will know. Yeah, first of all, can I just describe the para canoe as the great eight? If you've done the <laughs> Magnificent Eleven. 
Like so, it. So, yeah, the Great Eight and the Magnificent Eleven. Yes, the 21 for 21 radio series, a few names that people will know. Uh, in Yorkshire, for example, you've got Hannah Cockcroft, who has won five Paralympic gold medals. Duncan Scott, swimmer, won six medals at the last Commonwealth Games. He's on the series in Scotland. We've got a terrific lineup in Wales. Hannah Mills, the Olympic gold and silver medal winning sailor. Uh, Jay Jones, also going out on uh, stations in Wales, has won two gold medals. In Hertfordshire, I'm really excited about Legends Week because we love Legends Week and we love Helen Richardson Walsh and the GB hockey team. So she is our Hertfordshire legend for Legends Week. And Excess Manchester as well. We've got some terrific names there, certainly as well for football fans. Uh, we've got Ellie Roebuck, who will probably start in goal for Team GB, plays for Manchester City. There's a lot of Manchester City players, and we'll be featuring a number of them on Excess Manchester. I think covered all the regions there. I think so. I think so. And one that I didn't mention for Yorkshire, Johnny Brownlee, who's uh, I think already been on, actually, uh, but you'll be able to find him online. Johnny Brownlee is in Team GB for triathlon, as we know, but it seems like his brother Alistair won't be. And it looks like Samo Farah won't be competing at this year's Olympics either. The double Olympic triathlete champion Alistair Brownlee was disqualified at the World Series Leeds event, needing to outperform his British rivals for a return to the Olympic team. Alex Yee, I think he virtually booked his place with a victory in the men's elite race. Alistair said afterwards he's had some ankle problems, he needs a surgery, and he'll focus on that before returning to Ironman competition. I wonder whether it means we'll only send two male triathletes now, which will be Johnny and Alex. I think there is perhaps an opportunity for someone else to qualify, but qualification opportunities are very limited. And for Alistair Brownlee, it looks like the Olympic story and a glorious Olympic story it's been is over, as it probably is for Mo Farah as well. Retired from the track in 2017, then decided he wanted to return in time for Tokyo, having had a bit of a go at trying to get there in the marathon. Failed to finish in the top two of the 10,000 metres European Cup and British trials in Birmingham at the weekend too. That's the headline that most people will have read and written. Uh, but let's mention Mark Scott, who won it um, from North Allerton in Yorkshire, qualified for the Olympics for Great Britain. He is the, the new name, um, over 10,000 metres. So, I think what we've heard, John, is that the Olympics delay for 12 months has been useful for some, and we've seen some squads coming massively into form. For others, though, it's probably just been a year too much, and, and that would probably be the story with Alistair and, and Mo. Yeah, even from the people we've heard in this podcast, Laura um, is in a place now where she feels she can go and compete. Same with Bryony in the trampolinists. A, a year gap has, has allowed them to, to refocus and, and get ready. Same with some of the rowers. Uh, I spoke to Josh Bujaski, um, f- um as part of the series for, for XS Manchester. And he was like, a year ago, I wasn't in the boat. And now I'm in the men's eight boat. So you're right. It has allowed and been useful for some athletes. But... Changing the guard, it feels like. A changing of the guard. And you always get this in the Olympics. It was like when Sir Steve Redgrave uh, came to an end um, in, in Sydney 2000. Sounds like he uh, passed away. but you know He, didn't, I mean. he, he didn't come to an end. He's still there. <laughs> He's still around and, and still coaching, uh, of course, as well. But it feels like quite a big thing when we're talking Mo Farah. Ali Brownlee. These are people we remember. Ali in Hyde Park at London 2012. And then once again on the Copacabana Beach in Rio, performing and getting that gold medal again. And Mo doing it twice in the 5 and 10. And doing it again in the 5 and 10 in Rio. And the World Championships uh, in between as well. It feels like a different time. And Father Time does ultimately yeah. catch up. And I think for for us in particular, and certainly in this country... We have such great memories of London 2012 and it's it's those 2012 heroes that have shuffled off the stage a little bit now. And mm. I think that is just perhaps a little bit more pertinent because it was that home games, because it was so successful, because all those medals were won on primetime TV in our country, in our capital. There's that extra little bit of sadness, if you like, to see some of those people now go into the next stage of their life. Tell you what, as well, it also shows winning five medals in five games that Sir Steve Redgrave did and Dame Catherine Granger is a monumental achievement to deliver at that level. So we have mentioned uh, some older names. What about some new names? Well done to Skateboard GB, 
Brand new sport, of course, coming into Tokyo for these games. Sky Brown and Bombette Martin have qualified two places for Team GB at the Tokyo Games. Of course, they now um, have to go through official nominations and team selection. They've got the quota places for Team GB. Now it's up to the selectors that we've been talking about in this podcast to pick the people to compete. But Sky Brown and Bombette Martin, well done to you and all at Skateboard GB as well. And talking of well done, Michael, just very quickly on the triathlon, the World Series, elite sport, para sport, multi-range, age-range competitors and a crowd as well in Leeds. Another brilliant event. Yeah, it was different. It's the first time I haven't been there, so I got to watch it on telly this time. Probably saw more of it than um, I have when I've actually been at the event where you're shuttling between Round Hay Park and the city centre. All took place in Round Hay Park. Credit to British Triathlon for getting that event on. Like you said, had everything. Had the 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 mass participation part of it. It had crowds. It had elite sport. Had you know terrific results as far as you know, British triathlon and British triathletes are concerned with Jess Learmonth, of course, um, and Sophie Sophie Coldwell, as well as Alex Yee winning the men's. And and it happened and it took place and it appears to be safe. I know they did so much work in the build-up to ensure that that event happened and, you know, a a brilliant event for for Leeds. Um, Obviously, all part of the Brandley legacy. That's why it's there. That's why it started. You know, and great that it it was... uh, a world championship, a world series event, a world staged event that, that got away and got away safely. And the first time the Para World Series was hosted there as well, Lawrence Stedman and Claire Cashmore, frankly, doing the business ahead of selection for Tokyo because they haven't picked the Para triathlon team yet. No, but I think if you've mentioned those two names, you might want to <laughs> feel that they might be there. I think I think it'd be a good bet. Talking of doing the business, we've said these athletes are primed and ready to put on a show this summer in Tokyo. Give the British crowd and, of course, the world something to cheer about on their TV. So two world records in two days in the women's 10,000 metres. We talked about the men's earlier. World champion from Netherlands, Sifan Hassan, knocked 10 seconds off the best time ever over 25 laps, clocking 29.06.82 before Ethiopian... Uh, Letisonet Bay Gibe, who um, was in the Ethiopian trials that took place in Holland just a couple of days later, smashed five more seconds off the record time, clocking 29.01.03. Of course, it's being dubbed the Super Shoes, Super Spikes era, but it can't be just that. No, it can't be just that. A word on the shoes. Sport innovates. And if we didn't want it to innovate, and lots of people have been critical about the shoes, we'd still be running in plimsolls around a cinder truck like we were in 1964 in Tokyo. We'd still be riding penny farthings around the velodrome. You know, in cycling, we moved it on in 1992 on a Lotus bike with Chris Boardman. It set up a program that's delivered bundles of medals at world, European, Commonwealth, Olympic level. Cycling continues to innovate. The technology continues to innovate. Tracks are innovating. Stadiums are innovating all the time. Why shouldn't the shoes innovate? Spikes came in. They were a new thing. They helped performance. Swimming, they knocked it on the head a bit when they brought the the swimsuits in and then they, they kind of retrospectively changed the rules. But to all those people getting themselves really worked up about these new shoes, yes, I'm I'm sure it's aiding performance, but... That's what happens in sport. Footballs improve and get better. Rugby balls improve and get better. What what do we want? It just to, to stay how it is? And I spoke to an athlete this week and was talking to them about the shoes and was like, what do you think about it? And they were unquestionably saying that they have helped. But I don't think that is the major concern. The concern that they had was that when they first came out, it was only one brand. Now, actually, again, the delayed Olympics has allowed other brands to use the technology. It's a bit like the COVID vaccine. One company comes up with it, another one comes up with another one. And and and, and the whole competition uh, to have the best shoes or the best vaccine uh, works. So, you know, New Balance have got new shoes that are faster, 
so have Adidas, so have Puma. So again, they've it's kind of leveled off. It feels like it's leveled off. And from what the athlete was saying to me was at the start it felt unfair, but it feels like it's it's in a better place. But you just want to make sure that when these new things come out, there is regulation quicker and they allow it to be a fair competition because that's what ultimately we all want, whether we're talking shoes or whether we're talking, you know, drugs or whatever. Yeah, and in cycling, for example, change this time around, you kind of have to declare your technology at an earlier part of the season. You can't just bring your best bikes to the games without anyone having seen them before. That might affect the medal tally for the British team on the track where traditionally they've they've kept stuff back to when it really mattered as far as they're concerned. Anyway, that's an aside. Para-athletics, uh, Poland was the setting for another successful event, this time the 2021 Euros, the last major championships for the Paralympians before Tokyo. Great Britain won 37 medals, Ooh. 14 golds, 9 silver, 14 bronze. Para-head coach at British Athletics, Paula Dunn, said afterwards uh, she was proud of the young athletes who were showing great progress. This British team wasn't packed with the names of Cockroft and Peacock and Whitehead from 2012 and 2016, although Paralympic and world champions Libby Clegg, Alid Davis, Dan Greaves and Sophie Hahn all delivered again. Lots of other new names to tell you about. Columbia Mango, uh, Kaylee Hago, Maria Lyle, Zach Skinner as well, all delivering gold medals. Well done, all of them. Talking of medals, Olympic champion in sprint canoe, Liam Heath won silver in the European Championships again in Poland. Poznan this time, after winning his heat straight into the final, Liam just missed out on gold by two hundredths of a second to Hungary's Sandor Totka. In football, there's concern over the fitness of Team GB goalkeeper Karen Bardsley after she pulled out of the England Lionesses squad this week. The selected Team GB player, Team GB players made up of England, Scotland and Wales were the recent subjects of a special anything but footy. And if you missed it, make sure you download it and have a listen. They come together on June the 17th and they've announced a friendly against Zambia in Stoke on July the 1st. It won't be a cold, wet Tuesday night in Stoke, at least I hope not, because I'm planning on being there. <laughs> it could be a cold, wet Thursday night in Stoke, though. Yeah. It is the British summer. <laughs> to be fair, uh, talking of England, the men's England hockey team are competing in the Europeans in ne- the Netherlands this week. They're through to the semi-finals, a 3-2 win over Spain to top Pool A. They now face Germany and Sam Ward uh, continued his return from facial reconstruction, scoring a hat-trick. Absolutely incredible stuff. Uh, disappointment for the England women, though, letting in a last-minute equaliser with Belgium, and that draw, 1-1, meant they missed out on a last-four place. And we'll finish with the continued focus on the Olympic Games, with it being just six weeks away now. Team GB, or to give them their proper name, the British Olympic Association, I feel like I should put a blazer on when I say that, they've issued a message to the people of Japan. And we know that public opinion in Japan has been very anti-Olympics. They are going through a tough time at the moment with rises in cases. Some of the latest opinion polls from Japan suggest that it might be turning a little bit. One of the reasons behind that might be the fact that the IOC are putting more and more stringent things in place to stop the spread of covid And, as I said, a message to the people of Japan from the BOA. They've said they'll do all they can to keep the people of Japan safe during the Games next month. Hugh Robertson, who's the chair, has said in a letter to President Hashimoto that the BOA is in the advanced stages of ensuring the entire British delegation is fully vaccinated for the Games. 85% of those travelling have received one jab already, and the team and support staff will undergo rigorous testing and isolation programmes for the final 14 days before the team depart for Japan, in order, I guess, to make it as safe as it possibly can be. Absolutely. It's getting close. A delay often means to fall behind or putting something off. The delay to Tokyo 2020 has meant an end to some Olympic and Paralympic stories, but it's also meant an opportunity for others. We can't wait to hear about them all in the Games this summer on Anything But Footy. Sports Social Podcast Network. 
With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.